Other people coming in. We'll just wait a minute or two to see if anybody else joins us. Welcome to everyone who is here. Um, this is the Center for Dispute Resolution uh, noon workshop that we try to have monthly. Um, today's workshop is Managing Intergenerational Conflict and in Communication uh, with Dr. Aaron Wehrman, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication. Um, this is a really fascinating um, presentation. And Aaron does a great job of pulling in a lot of, of strategies and information that we might not be aware of. So I think you're in for a treat. Um, before we begin, uh, as you know, one of the things that we always try to do at the beginning of our session is to do a book giveaway. Um, today, book is Gen Speak, um, Communication Strategies for the New Generational Mix um, at Work. And so, Heather, um, if you will pick out of the hat who are okay. you lucky so our, our random drawing, it looks like Deborah Crone and Stephen Willis have both won a copy. So I will message you in the chat to get your info. Congratulations. <laughs> Very exciting. Okay. Um, and it is a great book, so you will actually enjoy it. <laughs> Aaron, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me and thanks you all for being there. I see several familiar faces. Um, I guess you aren't all completely sick of hearing me talk, which is great. Uh, so I, I'm so glad to be talking on this topic, managing intergenerational conflict of communication. It's, it's such an important topic, right? Um, it's really popular. Pretty much everyone in here has some experience dealing with whether it's intergenerational communication or conflict or maybe a little bit of both. So I'm hoping to give you a little bit of overview on what it looks like and maybe, maybe a few tips for how to handle it even better. So uh, to jump in just a little bit, uh, I'm gonna start off with kind of just defining what, inter what I'm talking about um, and why it's important. Uh, looking at some different perspectives and looking at some of the qualities of different generations, I'll be asking for your help uh, throughout. Um, and when I do ask questions, feel free to, you know, un unmute and say things or uh, type them in. And then we'll end off with some strategies. And if we have time, um, some actual participation looking at scenarios. So let's go ahead and get in here. So when we look at uh, a generation, um, what, what comes to mind? How would you define what a generation is? We're going to test your participation right now. I, I don't know. I think that technically there's so many years apart in a generation, but for me, I see that it's like a group of people that are in similar age ranges that have experienced the similar things and have similar ideals in how they process it. Erica, that was, that was so good. And then I see Travis also said something similar, a group of folks in a similar age range. That's essentially right. So a generation, um, uh, a good definition is an identifiable group that shares birth years, age, location, significant life events at critical developmental stages. We can also look kind of more broadly and think about generations like in a family. Um, so, you know, different generations of that family, parents, grandparents, and, and Either way, um, these are important kinds of forms of communication to deal with. So I wanna hear a little bit from you, um, you know, maybe why you're here today. Uh, what experiences have you had communicating with different generations? Um, anyone to share any challenging things they've experienced or beneficial interactions? <laughs> uh, in the chat, I see things that are funny to you don't land with young people that have never seen the TV show. I been dealing with that in my own classroom lately. Yeah. See Erica unmuted. Yeah. Oh. The process challenge. What is the word I want? So the, the gender changes that are happening, the transgender and conversations, they don't go over well with 
other generations. Okay, so changes in our social kind of atmosphere, maybe not going over well uh, with different generations. I like that. I see Katie unmuted too. Yeah, I just, the um, making assumptions about knowledge with the different generations and for my work I have to really strive to stay current and I notice as I get older that's harder and harder uh, but still it's making those assumptions because like I also shouldn't assume that a 20 year old student worker knows more about technology than I don't because sometimes they don't. <laughs> yeah. Oh that is so true I'm always baffled by things I assume my students know because I and, and, and they don't. But I like that you brought in this assumption of what people should know, and what they should know, what they think about you. Yeah, exactly. Um, I see someone in the chat said living with the greatest generation. Um, uh, some of you may be caregivers, uh, some of maybe grandparents, parents um, in, in, in the daily life. So most people have some kind of experience dealing with a different generation that is problematic or maybe really beneficial, maybe something that happened really well. And hopefully the strategies will work for, for both of those kind of uh, situations. So thinking more of the workplace, because I know a lot of you probably are here because of workplace issues and things like that. Um, right now we're dealing with five generations, at least in the workplace. So uh, this is still from 2016, 2017, this chart. But you can see that millennials right now have become the largest generation in the workforce, which is, it makes sense just because of their age range. We can see boomers, uh, kind of the top line and going down a little bit, they're starting to retire. Gen Xers uh, staying about, uh, you know, average there. We're starting to see the silent or the greatest generation, depending on which name you use. They are starting to teeter off. We're not seeing them quite as much. But our post-millennials, our Gen, Gen Zers, we're starting to see a lot more of them. And then pretty soon we're going to have whatever generation comes next. So we're dealing with five very different generations all together working together. And I know that can cause some issues sometimes as well. So going back to thinking about your own interactions, we, we do interact with people from different generations every day. We may not always think about it though, because in our family, you know, if you have kids, that's a different generation. Your parents, their parents, um, we, we deal with these very well, pretty often. And we tend to be fairly good at, at it, but we only notice the really kind of um, problematic situations. Our friends, although we tend to be closer and friends with people of our own generation, um, you may have people from all kinds of generations, um, especially working at a college and having maybe student workers and, and, and people like that. And then, you know, of course, in the workplace. The issues that kind of come here is that it can create a lot of obstacles. Thinking again about the workplace, this can create issues with hiring, um, hiring people because you're expecting someone and, you know, this new applicant may not fit that, uh, turnover, because if someone doesn't feel comfortable, and then things just regarding confusion with roles and communication. So being able to do this better is really powerful. Being able to, uh, you know, not have these difficulties at home or in the workplace can, can help us to successfully navigate that communication and make us more effective, whether we are talking about being a worker, a family member, or a friend. Um, and these are really the highlights of why this is such an important topic. We all deal with it and not always super well, and, and that can create a lot of uh, frustration in, in those different contexts. So uh, one thing that I do want to point out, too, that there are different perspectives for how we look at intergenerational communication. So the biggest, I would say the most prevalent one that I see is this first one in that each generation is different, just there's something innate, inherently different about them. And those come from maybe shared events, influencing them. So they have similar thoughts, similar values, similar behaviors. And where the conflict comes in is that these qualities are different across generations. So that generation X is different than generation Y, which is different than baby boomers. That's a pretty common perspective. Now, um, a second perspective, and I don't think that these are necessarily in conflict with each other. I think they both could be a little bit accurate, um, but people tend to be a little bit more drawn to one or the other. And if you want to know my perspective at the end, I'll, I'll be happy to tell you. But um, that differences aren't necessarily because of unique generations, but more caused by people just being in different parts of their life 
or their career stage. And I think there's are both really powerful perspectives and they can both benefit from learning more about different age groups, different generations, their experiences and their history. So think about as we're going along, which one you think you know, makes more sense to you. And I'll provide some research that you know, might sway you one way or the other. So uh, I'm gonna need your help a little bit here, thinking about uh, different questions. Uh, there, yeah, Erica, I saw your note about dress codes are different for different generations too. Yes, when we talk about some of the strategies, that's an important one too. So let's look at first the silent generation, uh, sometimes called the gener uh, greatest generation. So, and ignore the dates so much. I know there's a lot of uh, controversy on, you know, where Gen X ends and millennial begins and things like that. But these are just kind of the, the more, the broad age range. So we're looking at people born pre-1945, but I will look at some of the influencing events for each group and some of the values that kind of come from them. So thinking about this group, we see World War II, the Korean War, the Great Depression, New Deal, um, depending on when they were born. And a lot of them were raised by parents uh, who experienced the Great Depression too. So some of you might think about your parents or grandparents who never got rid of anything. <laughs> And it probably came from their experiences, um, maybe not having a lot. Can you think of any other big influencing events for this generation? Television. Oh, maybe television kind of um, appearing. Um, yeah, as 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 in their childhoods. Yeah, emergence of those. Uh, more women in the workforce from that generation. Yeah, that's a really great one. We're starting to see more women enter the workplace. Absolutely, which is was kind of new for at least US. Anything else? You do think of something? Oh, beginning of civil rights. Yep, yep, yep. So we see a lot of values whenever we think about this generation. Um, the ones that I see most common is they really like rules. And when there's a rule, you adhere to it, right? But also sacrifice. You sacrifice for your family or maybe your country or your workplace. Uh, a lot of times these are going to be people who started in a job and stayed there for a long time because of that loyalty. Um, if you have any other values, again, throw them out. I'd love to hear them. Let's, uh, let's look at baby boomers. So uh, some of the influencing events that... I see pulled up to um, civil rights here, Vietnam War, we see emergence of space travel. Um, what other events would you throw out here? Well, they saw a president assassinated. Yeah, yeah so presidential assassinations, huge, huge. Others? Um, they saw a, a president impeached. As well. Impeachment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, they a lot had of a rough time in politics, on. didn't they? Yeah. 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 <laughs> a lot of a lot of stuff going on. Cold War, Summer of Love. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, again, keep throwing these out. Um, and an introspection and self help. I like that. Starting to become more acceptable um, in this generation. So the values that I pull out a lot, so the Cuban crisis, yeah, would be, there tends to be some optimism here. So this is kind of when, um, to some extent, the uh, kind of American dream started becoming like the big, I don't know, theme um, uh, of their first generation college grads. Thanks, Karen. A lot of really good ones. But there's also a lot of competitiveness because you know you want to succeed, that you have those opportunities. And so to do that, you have to be competitive there too. How about Generation X? Also, you know, sometimes the forgotten generation to some extent. So we see things like Watergate, increase of those dual income families and single parents. So from that, we see a lot of latchkey kids. So people who had to stay in school and wait for their parents to get off work, um, energy crisis, downsizing corporations. And one thing of note is that um, comparing these different generations, uh, they say that this is the first generation to not do as well as their parents. So we kind of see the economic downturn for, uh, in some of these people's more formal years. Uh, what other influencing events were meaningful to anyone in here? Or would you throw in here? Columbine? Uh, yeah, the Columbine really um, 
define Gen X and millennials for sure. Yeah, rugged individualism. This is where we start seeing that become um, popular too. Those are good ideas. But you can see a lot of really negative things um, kind of towards that end of that list. And so we, Gen X, I mean, they're known as the skeptical kind of generation, right? Uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, yes, yes. But they also see a little bit more of a value of work-life balance, and whether that comes from the dual income families, latchkey, or some of these other instances, um, you know, is unclear, but those are going to be the big ones. I see also inflation, recession, yes, um, big things that happened within these years too. So how about millennials? So the biggest event that tends to be what distinguishes millennials from Gen Z is whether they remember 9-11. Uh, but we also have the rise of internet, technology, school shootings. Again, going back to someone's in Columbine, definitely that's kind of the start to some extent um, here. War in the Middle East, increasing. This is where our costs for higher education, I know people in here know this more than anyone, really skyrocketed um, during this generation. Um, other things you would throw into influencing events here? Oh, less home ownership. What'd you say, Erica? Much less home ownership less home home ownership and that really bleeds into gen z as well mobile phones brian i love that you call them mobile phones too cell phones Pandemic. yeah lgbtq gay marriage yes and a lot of these too uh, millennials and we're bleeding into gen z as well social media yes um myspace anyone wake over the ridge oklahoma city bombing la riots yes so a lot of things going on here, but we're because of some of these things, we see more values in terms of self-expression and flexibility. And someone just threw up their job hopping. Um, yeah, we see millennials starting this trend where they don't stay in jobs quite as long as maybe uh, baby boomer silent. Um, and this is also bled into Gen Z as well. Ferguson, um, a little bit millennial. I probably put that more affordable in terms of Gen Z, but maybe for uh, some of the younger millennials too. Yeah, yeah, average of two years. So our youngest generation, well, not really our youngest, probably the youngest one we see in college right now. There's obviously a generation after them. We don't know a lot about them and they don't have a name yet, but our Gen Zers. So these are gonna be our current students. So global terrorism, 2008 recession. I had to throw up, I had to change this because I haven't done this presentation in about a year, COVID-19. Um, I cannot imagine how much that's changing both Gen Z and the, the next generation. You know, kids who've never experienced a normal year of school. But this is really the first generation to be born into constant media technology. So millennials were born where things were starting to be invented, but a lot of households didn't have them until they were a little bit older. But Gen Zers, this, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Um, uh, it's going to be just something that they tend to be digital natives, right? I had to look up some of the values because we're still trying to understand this generation because a lot of times we don't know things about a generation until they're a little bit older, but they tend to be more entrepreneurial. Um, a lot of my students have their own businesses. I'm not sure if other people have experienced that as well. And believe it or not, I found this in a study that they tend to be actually uh, more risk averse. So they, they don't, aren't taking the risks that many millennials um, I, I don't know if Gen Zers, Xers were uh, either, but they tend to be kind of curbing that back. And it might be because of, you know, the recession, terrorism and things like that. Any other big events that I, you know, I, obviously this is just three events. What other events in the last few years do you think would be um, for our, our Gen, Gen Zers? Gun violence, yes, huge year. Sandy Hook, yeah. Um, what? I, I was going to say Sandy Hook, but also cyberbullying. Oh, yeah. Cyberbullying really became a thing. Uh, Sandy Hook. <clears throat> good, good question. Social media, user generation content. Yeah, I'm not sure how risk aversive and starting your own business work together. Um, maybe it's because they're starting their own business with something that they feel more comfortable. I'm not I'm not sure. It's really interesting. Yeah. Climate change. Does the insurrection fall under Gen Z more than millennials? Um, probably more Gen Z, yeah, because more millennials were a little older. But again, I mean, these things happen to all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Whether they're in those formidable years. Riots, police, authority, yeah. Black so, Lives, BLM. Yeah, Black Lives Matter. Um, 
binary logic, more self-aware. I love that as we've gone along, more and more answers because we just can think about what's happening to all of us and how they're going to affect our students. Um, um, yeah, mental. Oh my gosh, that's probably the biggest thing that I've noticed about my students and Gen Zers. They are such advocates for mental health that it's not um, stigmatized in the same way, which is really good, right? It is really good for the future too. So we all have a good idea about what each of these different generations are, kind of what they do, what defines them. So you know, what happens when we combine all of these different generations into a workplace or other interactions? You know, it goes back to what I talked about earlier, can have some big issues in terms of conflict, communication, and those things. So um, you know, what I just said, each generation has their own in unique circumstances. And because these things happen during, again, those formidable years, other generations who also experience the same things may not recognize how that affects people. And these can create some clashes and just our different ways of thinking too. So um, you know, we already asked you a little bit about some of your own experiences in generational conflict. What are some of the big sources that you see of conflict or what frustrates you about uh, other generations? Work-life balance, yes, that's a huge one. Um, different generations have varying perspective on, on what it means to have a work-life balance or whether it should even be a thing. Yep. Participation trophies are a huge source of conflict between generations. Yeah, so what it means to have a participate, what it means for participation trophies to exist. Definitions of professionalism, yes. Um, apathy. Work ethic, that's huge. Entitlement, again, work ethic, fixed Kate. <laughs> Loyalty, these are all really, really good. And really, uh, these are what we're talking about. Acceptance of diversity, political silos, family values. I love these, you all are great. Met oh, thank you, I'm so glad Travis, you brought that up. Methods of communication, so different technology uses, whether we should text, whether we should email, phone, calls, in person, and how those should be done differently what's important, career versus a job, kind of that different definition, male versus female things. These are really, really great. And they're really defining this issue of intergenerational conflict too. So I think most of you have, have really identified what I had on this slide that um, a lot of these issues come from, um, and I think, I think maybe Katie is what you said earlier about assumptions and it is a, it's a challenge when people act towards you because of some really ridiculous stereotype. And, you know, stereotypes blend outside of generation, you know, race, ethnicity, age, sex, all those things. But specifically about generations, when people expect us to be one way and not, that can be really, really frustrating. Um, and also, we do it ourselves, too. So uh, I think you named them issues of respect. Feedback from others, teamwork, communication styles, technology preferences, everything that you all shared. And I found this um, tidbit online and I think it's really true. So older generations may see younger generations as selfish, rude, and glued to technology. And younger generations may see older generations as selfish, rude, and inept at a, a technology. Does that sound about right? <laughs> I see some smiles in the classroom or in the, in the room. And that a lot of our uh, complaints about each other are the same, um, and except for technology, that seems to be something that's uh, that's a little bit different. So how do we deal with these conflicts? So I'm going to jump in and talk about some tips. Um, so with COVID and work flexibility, is that producing conflict with different generations? I bet. Um, I think it's changing our ideas of what it means to be work flexible because of the whole work from home. I think we're seeing a huge change. Um, that we're, it's, it's going to play out over the next three years with that. So um, to help manage our intergenerational conflict, a few steps that we can take. Revise your story, find common ground, seek out perspectives, respect differences, and strive for flexibility. Now, if you have been to other conflict presentations, you've probably seen some of these before because they are what we should do in any kind of conflict situation. So I'm, I, I hope you do get some reiteration of this, um, but I want to talk about them more specifically to intergenerational conflict. So let's work with um, revise your story first. 
So why we always start here, revise your story, is because in a conflict, in any really situation, you can only control yourself, right? You cannot control that other person, no matter how much we want them to put their phone down and listen. Um, we can start with ourselves, and so much of our perspective is coming from ourselves and not necessarily what's actual, what we're actually seeing. So one way to kind of, if you're having, dealing with a conflict with someone because of an intergenerational issue, think about what story you're creating. When I say story, what is the meaning that you are giving behind the person's action? So, and what is your role in that interaction and what are you telling yourself? Uh, we hear a lot of different like stories here that when people, when we, when we ask people about these things, a lot of times there'll be victim stories where, well, it's not my fault. It's, you know, it's their problem. I, I can't do anything to stop it here. You know, we have, we have villain stories. It's all their fault. It's their generation. It's their issue. And then, and then helpless stories, which I think go a lot with victim and villain stories. You know, nothing I've done has worked. It's helpless. You know, the, there's, there's nothing going to be, be happening. We have to also be really aware of these kind of self-fulfilling prophecies or confirmation bias. So self-fulfilling prophecy, this is whenever we make a prediction. And because we make that prediction, we act towards it as if it's already true. And because of our actions makes it true. So if you assume that, you know, this person, this new, maybe a new hire in your department uh, really just doesn't like people from your inner your generation you've heard rumors whatever and so you are probably going to act towards them kind of kind of mean maybe maybe defensive already by you acting that way they're probably going to be less nice to you because why i mean why would you be nice to someone who's being constantly kind of defensive kind of mean to you and by doing that you you have fulfilled your own prophecy right confirmation bias is huge too and i i do both of these as well it's really hard to get out of these cycles but this is where you search out information th that only uh, confirms your beliefs. So if you think person A in your workplace, they're always on their phone. Uh, you know what? I'm going to walk by. And every time I, I, I walk by, they're on their phone. OK, well, am I really noticing the times I walk by and they're not on their phone? Or am I paying attention to maybe every time I walk by their desk, it's during their break time? Or, you know, what, what is the information in the story that I'm telling and how do those things work together? So once you've kind of looked about the story that you're telling, start reviewing the actual facts of what's happening. This can be really hard, but it can be really, really helpful um, in any kind of situation. So what are you actually seeing? What is the objective behavior that you can observe um, kind of separate from that story? So every time I walk by, person A's desk, they're on the phone. Okay, I'm walking by at this time and this time. All that makes sense because they might be talking to this person um, and they, they can only do that on the phone or maybe they're on their break. And, and try to see if there's other explanations um, to, to what you're actually seeing. The idea that we wanna do here is not to use the generational differences to, to critique and separate us because all that does is make for a really miserable workplace. But if we can use them to explain and understand, we're, it's going to be much more powerful. So if you see someone you know likes using technology um, and they're always on their phone, well, maybe you're getting emails at the same time and they're just emailing on their phone because it's easier than on their computer. And if that's okay in your workplace, you know that that could be okay. It can also be really helpful to um, look at some of the actual research between generations. And I was really surprised when I first started out uh, doing this presentation by what I found in there. There are so many commonalities, way, way more than there are differences. Um, for example, one study found that baby boomers and millennials actually agree on the appropriateness of how to use technology. So like which things should be an email versus a text message. So overall, they, they actually agree. Um, another study found no differences among baby boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials on personality and motivational drivers, which goes against completely what we what we observe and we tell ourselves and really a lot of the research does not support these big claims that we make about generations so what some scholars have suggested is that it's probably you know, i mean we're, we're talking about huge groups of people i mean how can we apply any commonality right that it's probably more of individual differences supported by some of these, um, you know, different kind of experiences that they've had or life stage 
differences than it is this big generational difference. And I think by altering our perspective in that way, it can actually be a lot easier to deal with them rather than blaming it on, you know, their, their group, their generation. If you can blame it more on their just new, this is a little bit different, then it becomes a lot easier to deal with and, and, and manage. So um, after you've looked at your story, this is where you can find that common ground. So I already shared a little bit of common allies on the last Here's another chart. So they uh, examine millennials versus Gen Xers and baby boomers on what their uh, uh, long-term goals were. And they found that most, most groups have about the exact same goal in the workplace. If you look at the percentages, they're, they're very similar, very close. So the top one for most groups is making a positive impact on my organization. There's some slight deviations, you know, help solve social and environmental challenges, work with a diverse group of people. And then um, it goes down towards the bottom that I think the, the lowest one is, is the smallest one for about every group, um, starting my own business. And maybe with our newest generation, they're not represented here. Maybe theirs would be a little different. And you can see some smaller ones like experts, being, being coming an expert in my field, not as big for baby boomers, a little bit bigger for millennials and Gen Xers. So we're starting to see that there's a lot of commonalities between the generations, which again, can help us to, to deal with them a little bit better. Um, another study found that, um, you know, the top 10 kind of similarities uh, across generations were huge, that people across generations share way more similarities than differences. And here were the top 10 similarities um, across generations that kind of cross those lines that I thought were really interesting too that people across generations have similar values in terms of like value in family, value in generosity, those, those kind of just values that we teach our kids and things like that. Um, everybody wants respect. Uh, I, think, I think we can all agree with that. Trust matters, maybe for some generations more than others, I don't know. People want credible and trustworthy leaders, very uh, timely. Um, organizational politics are a problem. I think everyone can agree with that. Uh, number six kind of makes me laugh. People dislike change. Nobody likes change unless it benefits them. Um, but even then, uh, we, we really want to avoid that. Um, loyalty depends on context, not generation. So people agree that loyalty shouldn't just be because someone's been there for so many years, but because they've done well there and they've shown themselves to be loyal. Um, it's as easy to retain a young person as an older person older person as long as you do the correct thing. So how to re retention may be a little different, but it's the same uh, level of difficulty. Um, everyone wants to learn and actually most people really want a coach or someone to learn from. So I thought these were really interesting seeing some of these similarities, but they can really be beneficial for helping us to establish this common ground that, you know, you're dealing with this really difficult coworker. <laughs> Okay, well, let me think about some of the similarities we have, but maybe we're going about it in different ways. <coughs> um, if you're still not sure about what's going on, it can be helpful to seek out perspectives. And this is where you're just going to ask questions. If this person is just, you, you cannot figure out why you can't get along, and you're, you have a tendency to blame it as part of their generation, you know, step, take a step back. Is this something that's just normal for this age group? You know, people using technology in certain certain age groups, like, you know, the, the stereotype is older uh, adults don't know how to use it and younger adults um, use it all the time. So is this something that's just normal? Am I making a stereotype here? Or is this more of a personality issue? Because I'm going to handle it a little bit differently if it's a personality issue. Is this person really just maybe not aware of that you can do it in different ways? And um, asking this question, you know, is it what they want? Is it what they need? Is what they're doing getting them to the goals that you think they, they have? So seek out perspectives, talk to other people who might work with that person. Um, if you have someone who's a, a trusted confidant, that can be a really good way to just kind of work that out and, and, and see what's really going on there. And um, almost last but not least, respect differences. Uh, this is gonna be huge. Um, one thing I want to remind people, and I have to remind myself about this a lot too, that differences are neutral. Um, you know, our, our evaluation of them is completely in our heads about whether if someone uses the cell phone more than me, that's my perspective that it's a bad thing or it's a good thing. But in overall, differences are neutral 
and by taking that approach, it can be a little bit easier. So I, I, this is something else I found online that I thought was kind of interesting about how differences, you know, they're more important to the generations themselves, but they, they kind of come out in different ways. So baby boomers were told the future was theirs to own. Gen Xers found the future disheartening. Millennials question whether there is even a future for them. So there's, we all have differences in how we see the future and what that means. And all the events that people experience within those younger years might kind of change their perspective. So just remember that differences are neutral. Um, they, they are very, they're interpreted by all of us. So you can think about things like, you know, how are this person's life experience differences than my own? Um, how can I deal with that? And how can I, how can I bridge that gap? How can I make it from point A to point B? And then last but not least is strive for flexibility. This can be huge, um, but very hard to do. So what um, a few scholars, a few researchers did is they looked at some of the top organizations um, who had really good intergenerational communication, who really just thrived there. And they tried to find what were the, like, the five common things that those employers were doing. And they came up with this ACORN, I, I like it, ACORN um, uh, acronym here to say the five behaviors that these workplaces were doing. So the first one, accommodate differences, create workplace choices, operate from a sophisticated management style, respect competence and creativity and nourish retention. And these were how businesses were able to be so effective in these areas. And they all have to do with flexibility. So accommodating differences, this has to do with whenever uh, a workplace has people of different generations, it can be really helpful for them to acknowledge those, recognize those and help to facilitate those differences in ways that help those people be more productive rather than wanting to put you know, a square in a round hole, you are trying to help people uh, be better based on what they already need and what they're good at. So some of the advice that they offered for the silent generation, um, respect and praise loyalty. Um, they can be motivated by job titles and promotions that might speak to some of their different values. For baby boomers, the motivation was again similar. Um, promotions, acknowledgement of expertise, helping them to mentor. They really like to be mentors of younger workers, um, providing opportunities to share that expertise to others and building up to teamwork because of that competitiveness. And they also really uh, like that kind of regular feedback. And these, again, these are overarching things. You really want to make sure that you're going towards the individual person because not every person from this generation is going to be this way. Uh, Gen X, allow them to work independently if that's a thing. Uh, provide flexibility, schedules, benefits, be transparent, <laughs> be honest. Uh, millennials provide professional development opportunities for teamwork. That was the number one thing that millennials asked for is areas for professional development. Embrace the latest technology. You know, that can be really hard too. Um, they really like mentorship as well. So provide opportunity then for mentorship with senior workers and immediate feedback. So the timing is gonna be a little bit different. If you can give more immediate feedback, it's more helpful. Gen Z, we're still learning a little bit more about them, but um, some things that we've learned too is you know, having flexibility in schedules. I know COVID completely has changed that too. Um, give them responsibility. And again, uh, they have some similarities to Gen X. Uh, offer that transparency, be transparent, be honest. So by using some of these different um, differences, and, and being accommodating to them, you can be more successful. In so related to that would be our second uh, letter here, which is create workplace choices. So if you can, in a situation, create options for your workers to make better choices based on their own style, it's going to be more effective. Now, they had quite a few different ways that people could do this, you know, and I, I talked about, someone mentioned earlier about schedules. That can be that can be one here too, and again, I think COVID has, has played a big big role here. But allow people to make choices that um, kind of work towards again the differences, their success there, and it'll be more powerful as well. The O goes from operating from a sophisticated management style. Um, this is going away from I think intergenerational kind of assumptions and more towards unique individuals. So look at people's personal record. And again, 
these are hard to do and these take a lot of work. So this, this isn't something that you can just do, you know, for the moment. This takes a lot of knowledge to know about someone's personal record. But if you can help someone knowing their strengths, knowing their weaknesses, based on whether that's generational differences or not, and provide them with specific goals and, and work expectations, they're going to be more uh, satisfied and then you will as well. This, the R1 always, um, I think, is interesting too, respecting competence and creativity. We often get stuck into this kind of hole where when someone starts asking questions, we assume the worst. We assume maybe they're being lazy or they're trying to challenge our authority or they're trying to make things hard. What the scholars here suggested is respect that they may be asking questions to be more competent and, or to be creative. So uh, and this is hard. Assume the best in people um, and whenever you can. And if you don't know what a person's motivation is, this is a good time to just ask rather than thinking that they're, oh, they're trying to figure out how they can do this in the easiest, laziest way possible. You know, ask them, you know, what is your motivation here? <coughs> what, um, you know, what is this information going to be used for? Because oftentimes people are asking questions so they can be better at their jobs or be more creative, or maybe that is to do it in a more uh, fast or easier way but that's more productive. And then last but not least, re re nourish retention. I said earlier that um, they found that it is as easy to maintain you know, a younger worker as it is an older worker. And some of the similarities for retention um, of the people like are, are the same. So they suggest work for, make your workplace a magnet for excellence. And what that is talking about is provide opportunities for training. So learning different technologies, learning different skills, whether or not they are exactly what they do for a living, or maybe it can be more life skills. I mean, even these conflict ones, right? These can be applied towards work, home, whatever. But people really appreciate this training, continuing education kinds of opportunities. So this ACORN acronym, I know these are really hard, but they can be really, really effective for helping to catch people and really keep them um, um, in different ways. Um, might be a little bit different if you're thinking about how to deal with this at, in family life, but you could still think of some of the same things in terms like a parenting or dealing with family and friends as well. So I wanna pause, I've been talking for too long now, and I wanna do just a, a, a little practice session. So I've got a scenario that I'm gonna show on the next screen. And I want you to just think about if you were this person, you know, how would you um, answer the questions at the bottom? And I've got a few questions. <coughs> so uh, we're gonna do a younger worker to start. You've just started a new company in a position you're very excited about. You'll be on a team that is in charge of recruitment and retention. One of the main reasons you were hired was to help add fresh and innovative ideas for recruiting potential clients. You're also excited because during your interview as mentioned that uh, promotion would be possible in the future since the company was wanting to expand. So there's another person on your team, Jesse, and Jesse has been with the company for many years. She is from an older generation than you and is very loyal to the company. She was friendly at first, but seems to be acting negative towards you and all the ideas that you suggest. She keeps trying to act as your boss, making suggestions, offering unsolicited advice, despite being in the same position as you. During a recent meeting, she turned down another one of your ideas for recruitment, causing the two of you to get into an argument. So your boss wants to sit down and, and talk to you to resolve these issues. So um, let's kind of go through our steps here. What is your perspective? Uh, the person who's, who's, who's kind of talking here, what is their perspective? And what story are they telling about their behavior and Jesse's behavior? Who's going to be brave enough? I, I will. I guess the perspective would be that um, my perspective would be that I started this new company and they were excited, but that this other coworker um, is intimidated by new people on the team. So I'm telling myself a story that, you know, I'm really excited about being here, but this person is intimidated by me. Definitely a story that I, I'm telling myself too. So let's start thinking about the facts and thinking about Jesse's perspective. So what might be her perspective? What are the facts that I'm actually seeing here? Who 
<clears throat> yeah, so I don't, I don't want to necessarily imply that the other person is intimidated. That is my story. Um, that person, Jesse, may absolutely not be intimidated um, uh, at all. So that's that's a story. So maybe maybe it's something different. So Tr Trish is saying maybe Jesse sees an upstart who is trying to upstage her. Okay. Well, yikes, I could see why she's acting towards me like that. Maybe she doesn't like change. You know, we talked about no generation really likes change. Um, maybe some of my ideas are making her defensive. Oh, I like this, this last one. Jesse may have been told something different by her boss, by the director or direction of the company. Yeah, that's, I mean, happens all the time. Uh, maybe she's trying to show that she's ready for different leadership roles too. So maybe the promotion, she heard about it as well. So we're starting to see there are some different perspectives here. And we might think about the generation. How can their generation affect her behaviors? You know, we go back to, well, maybe she doesn't like change. Um, you know, maybe she, uh, you know, she, from, she thinks that younger individuals should be looking up because she's been there longer, whatever it is. Okay. Okay. I'm starting to little, learn a little bit about maybe why Jesse's acting that way. So if I wanted to talk to her, uh, what common ground could I find between the two of us? Mm, oh, Cassandra, I like that. So boss should align both position goals so overall company mission can be achieved. Yes, the boss definitely needs to be um, helping with this regard, but helping them to recognize their common goals. Okay, I like that. I think that may have been for the last slide, but it works for this one too. So common ground could be maybe Company goals, what other common ground could I probably find? I would ask about my ideas, if they're similar to her ideas. Is that what you're trying to say, Erica? So just open up a conversation about, okay, so you don't like these ideas. Is there anything in here that aligns with your ideas? And then trying mm -hmm. to find one thing you agree on, like in mediation, so that you can start showing that you're on that process. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I could ask, you know, what, what, you know, what about my ideas? Do you have an issue with? Because I would really like to understand, is there anything about my ideas that you do like is, you know, can I work from there? Yeah, I like that. So we could have other common ground here too of, you know, we both care about this company. Uh, we both like our positions. We both are really passionate about recruiting potentials. You know, you've been here for a long time. I'm starting out. Um, but we both are really passionate about that. But there's definitely opportunities for this common ground. So thinking about some of the strategies that we talked about, which of those do you think that uh, you or Jesse or the boss could do, use to reduce the conflict? As a leader, I would want to ask them each how they want to be recognized. So asking about how they want to be recognized, do you mean in terms of like um, the comp in the company and how they want to be like promotions kind of things? Well, like if there's a good idea or if there's something that they want to be recognized in front of their team for, maybe just talking to them and finding finding out what they prefer, because maybe Jesse likes to be recognized in front of everybody, but I prefer it to be private, which is why I have such a problem with her unsolicited advice. Yeah, that's really good. So I love that you're looking at the ACORN principles and you're trying to be very personal to each person of how do you want to be recognized for the ideas that you have or your contributions? Yes, I think that's a really, really good idea. Um, maybe submitting ideas in different formats. Ooh, yeah, Kate, that, that's really good too. So um, sometimes pitching ideas in a meeting can, can be problemsome, especially maybe if you talked about those ideas ahead of time and maybe they're taking credit for them. So maybe like it needs to be something more of, um, <clears throat> you and Jesse meet, have some ideas, and then you write them down and it, it just comes to the boss, or maybe it's through email and then the boss talks about them from the group, whatever, right? Doesn't really necessarily matter. But um, yeah, I think those are some really good ideas. Um, can you think of anything else based on any of the other stuff that we talked about? In my organization, we have a mentor program for new coworkers. Um, so to become a mentor to a new coworker, you have to go through this program to kind of prevent some of these struggles. And if an older generation likes to be a mentor, then maybe these two can work together in that way. Yeah. So maybe this, uh, the boss needs to see if there's an opportunity here for a mentorship program, because it sounds like Jesse definitely wants to share her knowledge. And this new person is excited about 
being here. So maybe they would be receptive and maybe really interested in that. And so kind of making them productive in that way could be really beneficial. Yeah, I like that. So let's look at um, kind of the opposite in a way. So this one's a slightly different one and I'm, I'm not going to ask as many questions because um, I know we're about out of time, but um, so you're working at your current job for many years. Business has been busy lately, so your boss has decided to hire a few new individuals. All right, normal, normal so far. One of these new hires, Andy, has been assigned to shadow you during this first few months. He's from a much younger generation than you. He's right out of college and seems very excited about his new position. You both have been working on a very important presentation for a client for the past few weeks. Unfortunately, some of your other duties have prevented you from being able to work much with Andy, both on the presentation and with shadowing but you think that Andy understands your situation. Later after the presentation, you hear from a coworker that Andy did not give you credit for your work on the project. You are frustrated and believe that Andy's trying to steal your work. So you decide to schedule a meeting with your boss and Andy. All right, same thing here. What is my, what's my perspective here? What am I seeing? And what story am I telling myself? Yeah, I did all this work and I'm getting no credit. Yeah, Andy's show order with no boundaries. Yeah, a lot of stories. I'm giving a lot of questions about Andy's behavior. I may be right, I may not be right. So um, what might his perspective be? Yeah, not a team player. Um, yeah, he did. He might be thinking, I did alone. I did this with no help. Why would I give them any credit? Yeah. Okay. I can see that because he thought I was gone. Yeah. Yeah. So again, common ground, probably about the same for this one. You know, we're both in this, this job here together. So what might be some strategies that we could use to reduce this conflict? Trying to impress the boss, they won't know um, if I don't tell them how impactful my work was. Yeah. Maybe Andy's relationship with the client and new name and damage the presentation. Yeah. So definitely, I would say some maybe the first strategy would be getting more information about what actually happened and maybe why Andy did this, because some we could have heard it wrong, right? Um, Galen, I like your, your suggestion. A team should always be we, not I. So the boss needs to work on certain strategies to help us work together. Uh, boss could stress importance of the job shadowing and realign job duties so they could focus more on Andy. Yeah, um, I think that's gonna be huge here that clearly both Andy and, and you or me or whatever, whoever this person is, um, they both want the shadowing relationship. Andy's probably frustrated that they've lost that. Um, and so they're taking, they might be taken out other ways, or they might just assume that this is the way it is now. So a, a good boss is going to help kind of bring that back together, um, reestablish that relationship and figure out how that credit can be done um, and, and focus more on that. So there, you know, and of course, a lot of the different strategies that we talked about today can work here as well. So good job. The only drawback of doing this on Zoom is I can't like look at people and make them feel bad and make them talk. Um, but I appreciate how much you all are participating. This is awesome. So today we've talked about quite a bit of things. So what we I've defined intergenerational communication, the benefits of learning. We looked at two of the approaches to these generations, explored the qualities of each generation, and overview quite a few strategies for for hopefully dealing with this a little better. So um, just really quickly, I want to make sure um, I, have, I have time for questions, but is there anything from this presentation that you've like point, pin, pinpointed or you think might be useful for dealing with conflict in your own workplace or your family or any uh, other context? Yeah, I like that. Generations are more similar than I thought. When I started doing this, I same thing, same thing. I feel like this would be beneficial to talk with my dad. He has lots of complaints about the young guys in the workplace, and I'm always talking to him about the differences, but I can tell him that it's not generational. It's just personal yeah. personality. Maybe share some of the, the commonalities rather than the differences. Yeah. 
uh, assuming the gaps aren't as big as I might think. Yeah, same. I'm, I'm agreeing with everyone here. You're so smart. Uh, differences are neutral, different stage of life, not actual differences in, in generations. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I'm heartened by the similarities. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Carissa. Uh, remember, uh, I'm going to remember acorn because it's uh, corny. Thank you for that. Uh, remember that I don't like to be labeled and neither do others. Uh, yeah, so great. So feel free to keep throwing those out, but I wanted to make sure there's a few minutes for a wrap up um, if there are any questions. And of course you can um, stay after and ask me or email me or the, the CDR as well. Yeah, respect is bottom line, Lisa. That's great, that's great. Um, any questions just uh, that you think the whole group would want to hear? Yeah, so oftentimes there's a generational difference in dress codes, which is <laughs> which is definitely generational and not, well, maybe it is different stages of life too, but like leggings, for example, um, sure. the older generation just sees them as workout clothes, where oftentimes in the younger generations, it's part of a it's just part of the fashion that they have. So yeah. how would you handle that? It's not as such, so much as like a, a personality. Oh, they're not doing their job. It's, it's a, well, they don't look professional. So I, I don't know if that's just more of an education piece in orientation or. Yeah. And it, you know, it goes back to accommodate those, those differences and create that workplace flexibility. Cause if it ultimately isn't that big of a deal, then we need to stop making it, you know, it's such a big deal. But in those kind of instances, um, I would I would go back to, you know, trying to figure out what my story is and how, you know, what what are the stories that I'm trying to tell? Like, is it because they don't like it because of X, Y, or Z? Well, what's what's really happening? Why do they really not like it? Maybe even ask them and talk to them about that and see if you can find some of that common ground for, okay, so we both agree that the workplace should be, this should be the dress code. And here's how these fit or don't fit into it, um, you know, and let's see how that works. So having a conversation about it is going to be, be your biggest one. But again, start, start with yourself, that common ground, some more information. Yeah. Great, great question, Heather, or Erica, I read Heather and Erica. Mm -hmm. message. Do it right at the time. So I'm just going to leave my email up here. If you do want to ask questions, you're welcome to, but thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciated the participation. This was absolutely outstanding, Erin. Let's give Erin a big hand. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. We hope that you will all come back on November the 3rd um, where Terry Hargrave from the Clay County Family Court will be talking about trauma-informed communication and conflict management. Thanks again, Erin, and thank you all for coming.